but we've only seen 600 units completed in the first half of 2024. To put that in perspective in terms of supply and demand, the city's projecting another banner year on population growth of about 12 to 14,000. So that's wild. Significantly outpacing any amount of rental units that are coming on the market. Right. Buildings are being pre-leased. Camponi Housing's Heart Road project is is coming on board. They already have a wait list that's in the hundreds. Uh, so that that gives you an idea of just how tight it is. Uh, builders are building, no doubt about it. Uh, but population growth is just significantly outpacing it. Hi, it's Greg Bamford with the Bamford & Co. Podcast. Today I'm here with Cameron Chuquette, uh from the CEO of the Landlord Association. Did I say that? Did I mess that up a bang little on. bit? Or bang on. Okay. I was practicing a little bit earlier and then I got corrected by Cam. So uh, I appreciate you uh, yeah, working with me on that. Uh, so today I, I wanted to get a little bit of a feedback because we keep on getting asked from people, how do we make it so that the rent just doesn't keep on going up? Um, what we found a little bit was that we hear that people are continually reaching out to us and saying, like, do you have an inside loop on, on rentals? And what we're hearing right now, especially on the east side of the city, is that we sometimes people are looking for a place to rent but they might have a, another 100 applicants for that one property, right? And so we keep on seeing an increase on that. So maybe give me some insight on, I guess, the way that you see it and ways that maybe we can make this level out just because I believe that we have an inventory problem, right? I think that's the way I see it, but I'd like to get your perspective on this. Well, it's no secret that the rental market is extremely tight. Uh, CMHC released results from past October that had vacancy at near decade lows. So we haven't seen this tight of a rental market since probably 2013. So that means vacancies sub 2% and in new neighborhoods in Saskatoon, it's even less than 1%. To put that in perspective, healthy vacancies about three and a half to four and a half. So there's no extra rental units available. When I joined five years ago, people could barter over $50 rent increases because there was 300 extra units down uh, the street right. that they could go and bargain on. And there was competition in the market. That is not the case anymore. So we're seeing rental rates rise about 10 to 15% year over year, which is far greater than we ha have seen in, in really a decade. What, like, where is, like, where, like, it has to get to a point to where people just can't afford to do it anymore. Like, how do, or and and the thing is like it how do we build more inventory i guess that's the next thing well the challenge with the interest rate environment and the cost of building supplies and labor post pandemic is that rental housing projects are less and less feasible unless rental rates are higher and right, higher that makes right sense. so there's got to be some they've got to pencil out right uh, we're still seeing a lot of good strong permit growth in Saskatoon up until the end of June, we've already seen uh, over 900 permits pulled for multifamily units. So that that's strong. Right. Uh, but we've only seen 600 units completed in the first half of 2024. To put that in perspective in terms of supply and demand, the city's projecting another banner year on population growth of about 12 to 14,000. So that's wild significantly outpacing any amount of rental units that are coming on the market. Right. Buildings are being pre-leased. Uh, Camponi Housing's Heart Road project is, is coming on board. They already have a wait list that's in the hundreds. Uh, so that, that gives you an idea of just how tight it is. Uh, builders are building, no doubt about it. Uh, but population growth is just significantly outpacing it. Yeah, it's interesting because the, the research that we did was for resale properties, not rental. And, and but then at the same time, I looked at it homes by dream, which used to be Dundee. We heard that they're done building single family homes for this time. They're just going to develop land and build rentals. So that takes a large part into maybe helping um, build out inventory for the rental market. Uh, also, Northridge, uh, Beto, North Perry Homes, all these different builders are taking capacity from building new homes to being able to add to the rental market as well. But then that creates even more of an uneven balance for an inventory that's already really short on our side. I mean, I think we pulled it off today 
that single family homes that aren't conditionally sold with new builds that aren't ready by maybe December or January, we only have 412 that are available on the market. So I think we also had 258 that were also conditionally sold, but that just shows how fast things are moving. So how do we get out of this? Well, from our side, we need to build as many rental units as the city can take as fast as they can take them. That's a supply side measure. Right. A demand side measure would be to taper off uh, the, the amount of population immigration that we're welcoming into Saskatchewan. Now, I, I don't have a position on, on immigration flow. Right. Uh, the association is always looking for supply side measures. So we want to see more rental housing supply. So the, the GST removal on purpose built rentals that the feds did uh, in 2023 that's going to start taking effect in 2024 is a welcome measure. Uh, the provincial government's investments on the secondary suite incentive are, are an aim to increase rental housing supply. Uh, regardless of, of political views, uh, the Housing Accelerator Fund federally is meant to increase housing supply, more or less in the rental market here in Saskatoon. Those are all supply side measures, um, but ultimately developments still need to pencil out um, so that rents, you know, because you can only charge so much rent in a in a market like Saskatoon, you right. you can't rent two bedrooms for three grand, right? right. The market isn't there, so uh, builders are be, are being specific and and very measured in what they build to make sure that they can pencil out and be maintained over the long term. It's a very it's it's an interesting perspective because I seem see the same issue on the the real estate side of things right not just on the rental and for from us i just don't know how we're going to build ca capacity for the demand that's coming through here and, un and unfortunately i don't understand the affordable side of it right so um going into i guess rezoning i, I think that was another thing that people constantly ask me about they're like what's your perspective on this and Unfortunately, everybody's like not in my neighborhood, right? Everybody wants mm -hmm. change. Everybody wants property prices to come down. Everybody wants rental to prices to come down. But they're like, but I don't want it to affect my life. And I don't want a, a rental property on, you know, on my street. But I mean, I think that we all need to be able to give a little bit for the better good, right? For this to kind of work out. What's your thoughts on, I guess, the pros and cons on kind of the rezoning and... Um, some of the new development things that the city approved? Well, with any piece of public policy, regardless of, of political stripe, there's going to be pros and cons, trade-offs, as you might call them. Uh, the association that I represent was in support of the Housing Accelerator Fund and its zoning bylaw amendments and the parking amendments uh, because we need to prioritize densification. Right. We need to put more rental units, put more housing units in general within Circle Drive in existing neighborhoods. Okay. The days of my generation only living in 1,200 square foot bungalows are gone. Right. We're looking for different style of rental housing units. We're, we're, we're looking for different styles of home ownership units. So you're seeing lofts, you're seeing more townhouses, fourplexes, laneway suites, mother-in-law suites all in an effort to increase the number of units, the style and the selection along that housing continuum so that folks of varying income levels, family sizes, dynamics can make Saskatoon home. Um, the notion that we shouldn't rezone existing neighborhoods, in my mind, uh, is a pipe dream because the same way these new neighborhoods were built inside Circle Drive, they had to change and adapt and the city's growing to half a million. Right. And our neighborhoods need to be able to to meet that demand. Um, might be a little scary for sure if a fourplex pops up on your street, uh, but it's it's good progress. It's the signs of a growing city, and and these challenges are should be welcomed um, and uh, dealt with strategically. Uh, and to put it bluntly, there aren't going to be fourplexes put on every second lot in in Varsity <laughs> View. You know, that's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, as you know, the lot sizes, first of all, won't allow it to happen in the first place. And the, a lot of them are smaller lots, 25 to 30 feet width that 
you just can't do it. Exactly. And yeah. you know as well as I do, it takes a long time for existing neighborhoods to change. Right. You know, we're talking 5, 10, 15 years. Yeah. So this is everybody. Yeah. So it's just reaction right now. Absolutely. People being scared of what's going to happen, which I don't think. I think this is just where we're moving to. Um, another thing that I thought interesting, I read an article that you were talking about and quoted it and just talking about new development, especially with people with apartment buildings and parking spaces. I thought it was really interesting because a lot of these retirement places closer to, let's say, if it's Market Mall, a lot of these parking spots never get used, right? They're, they're based around the, the, you see them around the exterior of the property and they're never filled. So I, I kind of smiled when I saw that quote because a lot of people don't look at it, but as a realtor, you see this all the, I see this all the time, I guess. Certainly a lot of fear and emotions when you bring parking into the mix, but what I think people really need to remember is that those parking amendments aren't affecting any single current stall in the city. Right. It's only for the future from, you know, May forward or, or whichever month they approved it. Right. Um, we did a, or our member of ours did a study with their purpose built rental properties in Regina. They had during peak times of parking 30 to 40 percent empty stalls asphalt and land that is a complete waste of money that can go back into a building right or even better now be invested into more mm -hmm. rental housing units because you're just using the land so much more efficiently so how many more units? i was just thinking this but on average how many more units would you be able to build per building if you were able to, it, with that change it, it might be an extra four units on a on a two-story walk-up for example okay. i mean I am I I'm aware of a development over on Avenue P Avenue R country a seniors development. Um, they don't need one and a half stalls per unit, right. but that's what they were going to be mandated for. Uh, perfect example: case went to Development Appeals Board here, eventually approved, but City Hall denied the development permit because they were seven parking stalls short. Had the parking amendments not gone through, that one sentence parking requirement would have prevented 34 student housing units from being built in Sutherland. Wild. These are day-to-day -day decisions right. that impact developers and builders from building more units. So parking might be scary, but it's an absolute right step in the direction uh, to getting more housing built and using our land much more efficiently. It's interesting because, I mean, there are developers in Vancouver right now that are looking at maybe not even developing anymore because the cost is so high, they can't get a return. So if builders can't make any money to do this, they're not going to keep on building, right? So The staff at the Home Builders Association always tell me, Cam, broke home builders don't build homes. Right. Right. There, there's got to be an, uh, you know, a bit of a profit incentive there so that, you know, the same way in, in, in the landlord world, that they can reinvest in capital infrastructure, you know, replace windows and shingles every 30 years, and hopefully stay in Saskatoon and keep building and investing in our city. So I forget what year exactly it was, but I think it was around 2015, 2016, when the government put the PST into effect for the, for the new home 2017. builders. 2017. Yeah. So at that point, we represented, uh, my brother and I, 12 different builders, and they scaled from 1 to 12 homes a year. All those builders are now not building anymore just because that extra 6% on, on certain things just took them totally out of the market. So, And I think that affected a lot of people, right? So now it's only the large-scale builders that can afford to do it, and they're building in masses, right? So it's, it, it's interesting all the – and again, it's not a, it's, we're not bashing anybody on the, the government side or political or whatever. We're just trying to figure out a solution to give people insight into – where do we go and, and how this might work, right? So you're bang on. We've we've heard from members of ours that have left Saskatchewan because rental rates are higher in Alberta and Edmonton and Calgary, and you immediately don't have six percent PST on everything from doorknobs to shingles to all of your lumber, right? right. So uh six percent might not seem like a lot in the grand scheme of things. But what we've seen over decades is municipalities slowly, and, and provincial governments as well, slowly and incrementally raise development fees, cost charges, uh, and infrastructure levies to the point where 
governments are responsible for 20 to 35 percent of the cost of a home and that six percent is one of those line items that comes right back to you if you're buying right or it comes right back to me in a rent if i'm a tenant for my landlord who just built that building. Yeah, it's interesting. Like when you look at that five or 6%, a lot of those smaller builders, that's what they made on home, right? They're, they're, yeah. They don't make as much as you think they do. No. Uh, and uh, the overhead's high and they take a lot of risk depending on the market and interest rates and so forth. So um, I just want to thank you for coming in today, um, sharing some of your thoughts and your professionalism with us and insights into where this might be solved in the future. Uh, if anybody has any questions uh, for Cam or ourselves that you'd like us to highlight in the future, uh, for sure, reach out to us. Uh, again, um, we, we appreciate you watching and uh, have a great day. Thanks a lot. You bet.